service and celebration with that fantastic parade. Thank you all who participated. That was just so beautiful. Thank you, Sue, for your leadership. And then move into an anthem like you just heard. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? It's that time of transition from Palm Sunday into the Passion Week. For God so loved the world. There's a cross in the sanctuary. You can see it behind me. And the sermon on this Palm Passion Sunday asks why? Why do we have a cross? When we ask this question, we take up the word atonement, which I suspect that many of you have heard. heard. Most of us, when we hear the word, we think of the cross and the understanding that there on the cross, Jesus made a sacrifice, paying a debt to God in Jesus' blood, a debt that we are the ones who actually owe, but could never pay. So Jesus pays it for us in order that we might be saved. The theologian who constructed this idea was Anselm. The year was 1100 A.D., 1100 years after Christ, 1100. To see, how old is the United States? What is my point? This belief or understanding of the cross that feels to us so completely and utterly ancient does not come straight to us from a reading of scripture, the earliest scriptures as they came to the church. It is rather the result of a long struggle to understand what in the world the cross means. And his understanding was one answer. The blood atonement is one way it is referred to. It has spawned much writing, much beautiful art, and much music of which one piece would have been the one this morning the blood of the Lamb and the Lamb of God. And please hear me as we enter into the rest of this sermon. If this understanding is precious to you, if upon it an important part of your faith is built, please be at peace. It is part of the Christian tradition and means a great deal to many of us. But, it is also true that this understanding of the atonement has been a barrier to many, many people seeking to understand and embrace the Christian faith. And today, I want to reach out to those of us, and I have found throughout my ministry that in fact, no matter whether a church considers itself very conservative or very progressive, churches are filled with these people for whom blood atonement has always just been a challenge. Why would God require a blood sacrifice for us to be saved? And suggest today another understanding of the atonement. After all, what does the word atonement mean? It has three parts to it. At, one, O and B, meant, at one meant. The word has to do with making one, with unifying, bringing together. And in 1200 AD, 100 years after Anselm, there was another theologian, Abelard, who presented another understanding of the cross and atonement. It held that Jesus' courage and love for us shown on the cross convinced us, persuaded us to give our lives to Jesus, to follow him in life and death. This theory came to be called the moral influence or moral persuasion understanding of atonement. So today, as we move from the pageantry and parade of Palm Sunday into the gathering gloom of the coming Good Friday, we sing of the cross with one understanding of atonement in the anthem, and we preach with the other. And it is my hope that for all of us, 
those troubled by the image of God requiring a blood sacrifice, and those of us who are not, that the story I tell you at the end of the sermon will move in all of us the opening of our heart to give our life anew to Christ and to follow Him. I'm preaching from a scripture that will be familiar to everyone in the sanctuary, I believe. If I speak in the language of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mystery and knowledge, and if I have faith as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love bears all things, hopes all things, endures all things. For now we see in a mirror dimly. But then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. So faith, hope, love abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. Let us pray. Holy One, be with your servants now and your servant that the words that are heard and spoken would be found well-pleasing in your sight, you who are our rock, our strength, and our place. Amen. Amen. A good friend of mine, faced with the prospect, the challenge of preaching on 1 Corinthians 13, wrote, If a dog could speak, it would be bone. When the homeless mother whimpers, it is home. If a trout could talk, it would be streams. When our souls murmur, it is dreams. If peace could pray, it would be dove. And when a preacher cries, it is love. Okay, so my friend isn't the best of poets. But there's truth there. Love. Wow. What a word, love. In the English language, we're really hamstrung. Because we only have one word, just that one word that has come to mean a variety of things, none of which are what Paul was talking about, what Jesus was talking about when he said, for God so loved the world. The two young people are out on their first date. They've had a great time, they went to a movie, they've had dinner, and now they find themselves alone. And they begin to hug and kiss. Suddenly, one is aware that her date has more on the mind than hugging and kissing. She stops it. What's the matter, he says. I don't want to, she says. I don't know you yet, and I'm not comfortable. Oh, baby, that doesn't matter. Don't you know I love you? And our compassion goes out to both of them to all of us caught as we are in a culture that has made this beautiful and intimate human connection of sex into a commodity to sell things and a utensil of momentary gratification unmoored from relationship and trust. The word lust comes to mind, but love? No, that's not love. Oh, here's another way. Span a couple. You know, did, does everybody know what Spanakopita is? The Greek food? I love Spanakopita. <laughs> you know where AJ and I live? I love our house. Hey, it's spring. Can you say play ball? I love the four and one twins. <laughs> <laughs> you see how confusing it is? That's like. That's not like. Or again, just a couple of months before I came to be with you, Fran Eichner moved away. And we had a while to say goodbye to her. We had a special time in worship to wish her well and to tell her, Fran, we love you. But here again, the English language gets us. So for if all of a sudden we all could speak Koine Greek, New Testament Greek, what we would have said to her was, Fran, we phylos. 
Phylos means brotherly, sisterly affection. And as beautiful and sacred as that connection is, what we feel towards each other as friends is not the word that the apostle used, the word that Jesus used. That's phylos. But that's not love. And yet again, two people know each other and have a deep commitment. Through the eyes, they look into each other's soul. There is the curve of her body, the smell of her hair, the jut of his jaw, the broadness of his shoulders. And out of this knowing, they are drawn to know each other more completely still, to join together a longing, an instinct. It is, the poet says, the nectar of the gods. And surely, we think, that's it. That's love. Yet even here, we are limited. In the Greek, there is a word, eros. <coughs> but it's not love. For there is one more word in the Greek. It is the word agape. And what is it? What is agape? Friends, I cannot say what it is. No one can say what it is. All people have tried Volumes and volumes have been written trying to describe it. I think the Apostle Paul comes closest to it in 1 Corinthians 13. I will not try. I want only to point to the cross as a picture of a God. And so I tell you this story. May it carry you into the presence of a God. And please, God, give us a clear picture of of the cross. Her name was Maria. She was undocumented from Central America and found her way into the Southwest United States doing migrant work. Maria had three children, an infant, a two-year-old, and Enrique, her four-year-old. She was by herself. Her husband had been deported. Maria and her children were living in illegal housing an old two-story, long-abandoned farm building that had been condemned partly because of the rocks and canyons that made it so vulnerable to flash floods. Maria, one of the shadow people that we read and hear so much about. There was no power in this home, of course, living with kerosene camp stoves and heaters. She had no television, no radio, no way to be warned of the huge thunderstorms forming north of her, up the gorge. The flood came in the early morning while they were sleeping. By the time Maria woke up, it was too late to leave, to go outside. She fled with her children to one of the upstairs rooms, the one with a very small skylight in the ceiling. She was shaking with panic and fear, with terror. She could not swim. As the water began to enter the room, Maria drug an old desk over underneath the skylight and put her children on top of it and then climbed up there with them. Even reaching as high as she could, there was three feet between her and the skylight. The water was rising up the desk. It was then she heard it. At first it sounded like a chainsaw, louder and louder. Then it stopped, and there was a voice yelling and calling, Are you in there? Hello? Hello? Are you in there? It was a man who lived higher up in the gorge, who had seen over the course of time Maria down there with those children in the house, and he had come in his fishing boat and his small outboard motor. She began to scream, A key! A key! Here! Here! The water was now at the top of the desk, laughing over her ankles. The glass of the skylight shattered under the blow of the man's heel. And a foot and a face appeared there in the small of the opening. Mary, Maria screamed, Vistinos, Vistinos, my children, my children. He couldn't get to them. It was too small for an adult. All he had was a rope. The water was to her knees now. She was holding the infant, Enrique bravely holding the two-year-old. The water to Enrique's chest. She took the rope, the man had fashioned a loop in it, and she slipped it under the infant's arms and tightened it, and he raised the baby to safety. 
She lifted Enrique and the two-year-old up into her arms. Now the rope came again and round the two-year-old it went and up to safety. The water was now to Maria's waist. Then on the roof above there was a loud clashing noise, a scraping and a muffled yell and then silence. Maria looked to the sky. There was nothing. She had no way of knowing that the wild current had swept the boat off the roof and into the tops of some nearby tree. <coughs> she is left with Enrique, shivering and stunned. Her, her face looks to the sky, so to the skyline. Enrique looks into her face. The water reaches her chest. Somewhere deep inside, the Lord's Prayer begins. She realizes she is calm. She does not know where this comes from. But she is at peace. She thinks, God is with me. God is here. The water reaches her neck. She lifts Enrique up to sit on top of her head. She is aware of the feeling that God is alive. That she rests her sounds. As the water reaches her neck, she takes Enrique in her hands and thrusts him up as high as she can, looking towards the window and the light beyond. For as long as she can, she holds him there with all of her strength till the water is over her mouth, over her nose, over her eyes, until finally the water comes rushing into her lungs. And as she dies, the neighbor above who has fought his way back leans down into the room as far as he can and drops the loot over Enrique and lifts him to safety. This then is love. A God. The cross. Love of a mother for her child who would do anything to save it. It bears all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. It never ends. I, I, when trapped, am loved that much. You, silently, say your whole name inside your own you are loved that much. Friends, if we are loved that much, how will we respond? What shall we do with our lives if we're loved that much?